So the first question um, from Elizabeth, uh, she asks, how did uh, the enslaved people in Union territory, in those Union border states, react to the Emancipation Proclamation? The fact that it didn't affect them. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, yeah. They definitely, um, many of them were already politically mobilized, doing a lot of war work, um, doing uh, doing work with what are, what's going to become the precursors to the Freedmen's Bureau, which is going to be a big government institution, right? That's created. So many of them um, kind of choke it back and continue to do that work because they keep their eyes on focus on expanding this to the rest. And I will say this, it's pretty much the handwriting on the wall is that um, this, it might look a little bit limited, but it, it doomed the institution of slavery in, in the rest of the United States as well. It's just that Lincoln didn't probably have the power as president to just sign something saying that it could be gotten rid of every place else. So I think that they, they applauded it. They saw it as a positive. Many of them, of course, had family members in, um, a, in the Confederacy, also in the Union, right? If, you're, if you were an enslaved person um, in a border state. Um, even in some states like Delaware, where they tried to hang on for quite a while, um, it, it really, it's, it starts to lose its grip, uh, even in many of the border states. And Congress starts working on the 13th Amendment right away as well. So there's work, there's political mobilizing, there's work going on in Washington, D.C., and amongst uh, free African-American communities, not the enslaved ones um, in border states, but um, to kind of keep that going, um, Lincoln wouldn't have been able to do the 13th Amendment by himself, um, and he wouldn't have been able to get rid of slavery, really, if he wanted to in the border states, because he didn't have war power, right, over your own territory. You can't enforce war power on your own territory. Um, well, it's it's a tricky thing, because he would have said that the um, Confederacy was his own territory, too, but it was rebellious territory, right? So um, the, it's limited because of the war power, but I think that the handwriting on the wall was that it was going to go away. So really, um, in general, um, and we're going to see this in one of our documents, right, directly relates to this, too. Um, many African Americans just kind of were like, we're going to plow ahead. Now, that didn't mean that once they got into the military that they didn't protest things like unequal pay um, or poor treatment of Black men in the military. Plenty of, of African Americans tried to hold the government accountable to those things, but um, nonetheless, uh, tried to kind of keep thinking about the larger cause of freedom. Great, great. And, and, and kind of a related question is the operation of certain laws in the Union once the war starts, and in particular, the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, it's kind of an interesting case. Uh, did the North con continue to kind of respect that, particularly uh, for runaway slaves from, from the Confederacy? Or, you know, in, in that case, did the Emancipation Proclamation, you know, I guess, help uh, the Union in the sense of not continuing to return runaway slaves? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, basically, no, they had already gotten rid of it uh, before 1863, for the most part. It was a little bit subject to the individual opinion of military commanders in various areas um, and, and kind of civilian officials in various areas, but basically, after the war started, there's no more enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Act. And in fact, quite the opposite of uh, when I mentioned there are lots of uh, Black people who flee, right, from their um, condition of being enslaved and seek protection from the Union Army. And very, very early on in the Army, um, there are a few commanders who, who like, wrap their arms around there, they're like, yes. And they're, they're kind of commanders or, you know, uh, uh, lesser generals or majors who, who have not exactly abolitionist sentiments, but they were anti-slavery and they were Republicans and they, they would um, welcome this. They then classified those folks. This is where the term contraband comes from um, in that the federal government then classified people as, okay, um, even if we'll stipulate that you Confederates think this is your property, nonetheless, then it's contraband property of war. And so we have captured this contraband. And it was important because a lot of those people went to work for the US military. So even though I said black men were not allowed to enlist in the US military, many of them did work in what we now would see as logistical or support positions. So basically digging um, and um, 
knocking down trees and uh, doing intelligence work and like all kinds of things. So, so, um, and I don't know of any case of any fugitives being returned like from New York City or any or Boston or any of the places where they were kind of threatened. Um, and I can't even think of, um, there is some mob violence still against um, individual black families and black individuals in northern states. I mean, there had been that before the war, um, but there, there really, there's no enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Act um, after 1861, I would say. Okay, now that's really interesting. And, and that term contraband is something that my students always seize upon. And it, and it seems that the North is being kind of clever in, in using that term. And, you know, and, and kind of like you said, if the Southerners are going to call their uh, human laborers property, well, for this convenience of war, that, that works out pretty well. Even, even Lincoln uses it in the Emancipation Proclamation, right? That term. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of unfortunate in a way because it buys into the, right, to the terms of considering, um, you know, the chattel principle, considering yeah. enslaved people as property. Um, but it, it's doing it in this kind of way to leverage the powers of war to break up the system. So it's kind of like using the system against itself in a mm -hmm. way. Um, and uh, the reality was like, there's such a mass disruption of many parts of the South that are invaded, right, by by Union forces. And there's disruption from um, African American individuals who are just like done and who are who see it as an opportunity. So like without their their actions are the thing that makes it work. I mean, contraband wouldn't have been a thing if there weren't tens of thousands of people who were claiming refuge. And uh, that's they were the ones who were kind of driving. So in a way, they're the ones who kind of you know showed Lincoln not only what was possible but what was necessary and what could be added to the war effort. Great, and then. We have a, a question. It's a good question that I've actually, I don't know the answer to, but I trust that you probably do. Um, was there African-American service at all in the uh, Mexican-American War? Yeah, I think so. Um, and I'm trying to think, um, yes, there was. And I'm not quite sure. Uh, the thing I would have to check on is what were the terms of service? So I don't know whether, for instance, I mean, they're totally integrated units, even, you know, in the War of 1812 and in the Revolutionary War and, and in some of the Indian Wars as well, you know, that there are mixed units of, of black and white and also militias coming in and out. But there are still um, state militias that are kind of federalized in the Mexican War. So I suspect that's a point. Um, I can't can't think mm -hmm. of, um, I can't tell you like a lot of specifics, but yeah. I know there were black troops in the Mexican okay. war. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it would be interesting to think about um, maybe what was learned because a lot of the mil big military leaders on both sides of the civil war um, were either lesser officers or enlisted men or just kind of coming out of West Point during the Mexican war kind of received their military education in between the 1830s and the 18. 40s in that kind of era. And so it would be interesting to kind of go, I, I don't know enough detail to give you a great answer, but yes, there were black troops in the Mexican war. Um, and of course there were people of African descent on the Mexican side as well. So there's a lot of, um, it's, it's an interesting question in that case to have them facing each other. Um, yeah, and it's it's so important. So then, even and I didn't mention this, and I should have, but you know, of course, then even when um, black men are enlisted in the U.S. military in the in the army, they are in segregated units. So they are kept in the colored troops, um, and they are segregated, which is actually an innovation in the U.S. military because that is not. Although there were some segregated companies um, in previous wars most of black soldiers were not segregated in previous wars. So it's a, it's a, I think a lot of people are surprised that that's a change from previous precedent in the military. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, great. I'm going to, I'm going to use the, uh, the moderator's prerogative to, to ask you a, a question. It's a huge question. You can give, you don't have to give a huge answer, <laughs> give but, a small um, answer. but I love, I love how you talked about, you know, it's still not inevitable that the North would have won. Uh, I've been kind of preaching that this whole year that the worst swear word in history is inevitable. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I piggybacked on that. Yeah, yeah. Once once we decide that we're out of business as historians, right? There's no reason to to explain how or why things happen. Um, in thinking in, in those terms, what do you think was the best opportunity for the South to win the Civil War? 
I know a lot of military historians debate, you know, Lee's um, invasions into the North, you know, how smart that was, that maybe it would have been wiser to fight a more defensive war. But um, what's your take on, on sort of that big military history question? So I'll give like a, a tiny two-part answer. So I think the, um, the best chance to maybe continue the Confederacy as a national entity and therefore not lose the war or leverage things so that the North gave up and just let the Confederacy go, which would basically be winning, um, would probably have been that more defensive answer. Um, and to fight a defensive war, maybe they could have uh, stretched it out into a war of attrition or a longer conflict, kind of as the Americans did in the in the American Revolutionary War. Um, it's not that the US won the Revolutionary War, it's more of like the British were like, whatever, just get away from us, you know? And so um, that, might have taken place if there had been a stronger defense or if Britain and France had broken the naval blockade. I think if if Britain had come in on the side of the Confederacy and broken the blockade, that would have strengthened the defensive war and could have been enough to win it. Um, alternately, if you really want to say, okay, could the Confederacy have, you know, booyah won the U.S. Civil War? Um, I this is where I kind of was downplaying Gettysburg versus Vicksburg, but I actually think, let's say there's like some huge Confederate victory at Gettysburg, um, you know, that could have gone very differently. They could have captured Washington, D.C. Um, they could, you know, there are a lot of questions about that, or even like Second Bull Run, you know, I think invading uh, more successfully Union territory and particularly Washington DC was very vulnerable. The federal government did a lot to try to shore it up. Um, there's a lot of interesting studies about like the use of Alexandria, Virginia as a defense against DC. Um, you know, they, if you capture the other side's capital, you usually win, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it's 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 honestly true. And so um, that, that I think, you know, there is some reality now, I'm, you know, I'm not just speaking here. There's also video games and novels and right. There's like a million other things that look at that counterfactual. Yeah, like yeah. what if the yeah. uh, Confederates had won at Gettysburg? So I just think because of the location, if that had been a big decisive victory that then had enabled, you know, if you also maybe or both, if they hadn't lost Vicksburg and Gettysburg in the same week, you know, like you could have still resupplied with more troops from the West, more Texans flooding into Pennsylvania, you know, I, that, but that is very far-fetched and very much not what happened. Yeah, <laughs> very good, very good. Well, I, I appreciate you keeping us grounded here.